Right, our next session is called Goal, Gambling on Women's Sport. A lively and informative discussion about the exciting opportunities for operators in the gro growing world even of women's sport. My dear friends, I do appreciate it's the afternoon, but it is very nice to give our wonderful moderator a big round of applause as she joins us on the stage. She is the CEO and founder of Sports Business Connected. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Butler. Thank you. Welcome, Sarah. Great to see you. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, joining us. It's nice to have seen some new and familiar faces. I'm sorry if I can't see you in the crowd because it's really difficult to see anything <laughs> um, other than what's in front of me, which is probably a good thing in some ways. Now, um, women's sport is fastest growing area of sport. Uh, the media rights of the leading women's sport properties are likely to grow, they say, by three to five times over the next 10 years. The quality of the product, inspiring athletes, and new audiences attracts will drive the growth of traditional revenue streams in women's sport. But what excites many about women's sport is the opportunity for it ta to take the lead on high growth revenue streams. One of these, obviously, why we're here, is betting. Now, does anybody here, do put your hand, I can't see if you put your hand up anyway here, but um, does anybody here have the disagreement with the premise, is women's sport underutilized? Now, what my panelists will be here today, we're not going to be just talking about the problems. We want to focus really on the solution. So I'm going to introduce you to my inspirational speakers and very good friends after last night. It's probably why my croaky voice is starting to hurt a little bit. Uh, we have Robert uh, Blaschuk on the end. Uh, now, Robert is a CEO of Fee Construct, sports audience engagement company headquartered in Armenia. He's joining us from Yerevan, via Palma de Mallorca, via London, via Poland, privately a season ticket holder at both Chelsea Men's. Boo, anybody booing here? Um, but also he's uh, Ch women's Chelsea's team supporter as well. So that's less of a boo, uh, depending on which team you support. Now we have Ali Clark. No. Ali is an associate of the media and sport and entertainment team of DLA's Intellectual Property and Technology Group and focuses on the commercial exploitation of media rights, sponsorship, brand exploitation and intellectual property issues. She also advises on clients on gambling, sports and data regulatory issues. And finally, we have Charlotte Randall. Charlotte's background is product and UX, having started her career in customer research. She spent five years working in Pinnacle across a number of teams, including product, risk, and as a trader back in 2004. She then worked in senior managed roles in e-com, ed tech, before co-founding, where she is now StatsBomb in 2017. Uh, as the COO, she's built and led StatsBomb's team across finance, legal, product, UX, customer success, and HR from zero to a thousand employees. It's awesome me saying that, um, <laughs> that StatsBomb has today. And she's currently leading exciting new product elements that will launch next year and has recently set up StatsBomb's partnership program to build bridges um, within the industry. Now, I'm going to go straight into it. I'm going to start with you, Robert. Um, as the newly appointed CEO of Feed Construct, congratulations, by the way, um, can you give me more of an insight into what you currently cover with regards to women's leagues and competitions across different sports and what it represents of your overall portfolio? Oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, when I joined the company, I was quite happy to find out that uh, when it comes to women's sports, in this past season, Feed Construct has covered 170 women competitions across wow. 10 different sports. So um, thinking about uh, the popularity of the sport, it composed 20% of our current portfolio that we offer to our clients, whether this is live data, live video streaming, live odds or probabilities. Um, and when I was looking at those numbers, I immediately thought, why is it not 50%? How can we get there? And I think this would be an interesting challenge for everyone working in sports to create more sports content uh, in, in, in women's games, to create um, more competitions, more leagues that could create also more narrative and more heroes for people to follow. And what is the aim and strategy moving forward? I think quite important is to speak to the rights owners, leagues, federations, um, educate them about the commercial value and how they should 
also present women's sports to us. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was negotiating with one of the football federations uh, a rights deal, um, the women's rights rise to women's competition was almost like an afterthought that was just chucked in to the contract. And I think when it comes to commercial representation of women's game, there should be a little bit more of an attention paid because otherwise we end up in a situation like we now see the Women's World Cup where there is a dispute over uh, rights, the broadcasting rights. Great. Um, I'm going to move on to Charlotte. Um, talk to me about StatsBomb's commercial strategy of women's sport and how you believe this will help to grow the industry. Yeah, I'm, thank you, Sarah. Is the mic working? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, we've, we've always been really strong supporters of, of women's sport. I mean, we initially focused in football, so primarily women's football. Um, and since we launched our, our data in 2018, we've, we've really invested heavily into women's um, football and have just taken the long view on it, really. Like, we know that it wasn't going to immediately drive loads of revenue, but we know it's, one, like, the right thing to do, and, and two, that we really believe that the sport will grow. And, and if we put the investment in and create the data and create the inventory and make it accessible and, um, and useful, then, then the industry will grow, and we're really sort of proud that that's kind of part of our DNA and something that we've done from the beginning. Ali, I'm going to move on to you. We've heard the question many a time, are betting rights on women's sports events undervalued? Now, that, I've heard that asked a lot recently. Is that the case? Um, yes, that's a really interesting question. Um, so at least in the UK, uh, we don't actually have a, uh, a betting right as such. So by that, I mean, we don't have a standalone right which an events organizer can use to say, uh, to stop sort of a, a, a Bucky's uh, arranging the placement of bets on sports. But I completely agree with what my fellow panelists have said. Uh, traditionally, there clearly is a value in that for bookmakers arranging the placements of bets on sports. But historically, I think there's just been a real lack of focus on both uh, arranging uh, bets on uh, women's sports events, but also really engaging uh, female audience to place bets on both women's sports and sports generally. And I think if that market can be harnessed and Robert can build his 20% to 50%, <laughs> then I, th I think we're on to a, a real winner for everybody as with the increased exposure through engaging with audience, be that betting or uh, other media rights, then it, we're gonna get greater investment into women's sports and, they'll all sort of feed in together through media rights deals, gambling, sponsorship deals, um, rights exploitation. I think the uh, opportunities are endless for women's sport right now, and it's a really exciting time. Yeah, that's why we're here. Now, I'm going to move on to, to data. Um, according to a UNESCO survey, women comprise 40% of all athletes, but only 4% of sports media coverage. Now, women's sports get less funding, less promotion, less broadcast time, and even get the short end of the stick on data and analytics. Now, in 2015, an analyst at 538 wrote a piece on how there's no rich data available on women's sports. Now, a lack of rich data leads to fewer prop bets on individual players and less interest in wages across the board. Now, I'm going to throw this out, obviously. Charlotte, to start with, I hope you don't mind. Um, as the co-founder of Statsborn, which is one of the leading sports data providers, um, you mentioned starting out in football originally, uh, where are we with women's sports data uh, and what that means in relation to the new models that can be built and how this data can create more interesting product ideas to attract new audiences? Wow, there's a lot of questions. That's, sorry, that's quite one to throw at you to start with. <laughs> so, um, I agree with what, what you said. Yes. Um, I think that there has been a lack of data um, historically, and, and of course it takes time to build up inventories of data. Um, and so we're sort of in a position now where we've spent the last five years generating um, tons of specific uh, women's football data, which now means that um, like betting operators and, and other like organizations can make models based purely on that data. And the better your data is, the more perf higher performing the models are the more reliable they are, um, the more interesting opportunities come from product perspective. Um, we've seen it in the 
in the sports betting space, as people are preparing for World Cup, there's some interesting things going on and a bit of a stats bomb plug here, but our data includes <laughs> lots of um, interesting um, points around like passing, which is quite different in the women's game compared to the men's game. And you get different data points like pass height and pass footedness and intended recipient and a whole bunch of stuff around pressure, um, which just means that all of those things become available to put into sort of exciting different opportunities. Um, and our, we're always very conscious of, of having parity across data sets. So there's, there's no data points that you get on the men's game that you don't get on the women's game. And that's been really important for us. And as I said, it is just a big investment that, um, you know, now I think we are at a point where we, the inventory is big enough that, that people can start to capitalize on it. So yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, but you have to have the belief, you know, that it's the right thing to do. And it does cost resource and time and, it has to be part of the strategy and then not an afterthought, you know, um, actually your point, Robert, about not just chucking it in with the men's stuff is really, really important. Um, something we've seen on the commercial side um, and really spent some time to try and get it right to pitch the value. But so the value isn't necessarily the price right, that people pay. But on your point, if I may very quickly, what I find interesting is when it comes to the sports betting world, Sports betting in the wagering act is gender blind. So whereas there's investment for the performance level to build this deeper level of data, when it comes to betting itself, whether you bet on women's football or men's football, is it women's badminton or men's badminton, one euro, one dollar, one pound or whatever currency you're using would also give you the same return if the odds are right. So my point is that from my experience at FitConstruct, we see that the actual wagering uh, element to it can already create revenues for women's sports right now, but the longer tail opportunity with performance can even increase and deepen those opportunities going forward. Yeah. Sorry, I just made you... Just... No, it's <laughs> great. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of quite engaged. I'm forgetting I'm moderating this sometimes. Yes, yeah. carry on. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was just going to throw out, what, you know, what do you think... Um, from your point of view, what more needs to be done to increase the understanding of how how valuable quality women's data is? I mean, um, can it, you know what it means to the industry and the growth revenue streams, really? I think it's um, it's it's valid across men's and women's um, sport, actually. Like just generally understanding uh, the importance of quality data. Like you said, it doesn't actually matter yeah. if it's men's or women's. Um, it's about getting. Um, understanding of how quality data can in create better products and more reliable um, pricing and odds and um, more different opportunities and props and such. So I think that that's a general challenge across the industry, uh, not just for the women's um, football. I think the extra challenge for the women's sport is just that it's really quite new. Yeah. Um, so you're starting from a, you know, more of a blank canvas. Um, and so you need to kind of educate your players and betters as well as the operators. So kind of everybody needs to learn together. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Um, right, we've, as we've got our lawyer on stage with us and she hasn't sort of looked at us badly yet. So we seem to be on track <laughs> and haven't said anything wrong yet. So this is good. Now we're gonna talk a bit more in sort of legal terms here. So Ali, the, the groundbreaking agreement uh, announced back in April, which um, most of us will be familiar with, uh, back, back in April this year, under which the Premier League clubs have banned match day front of shirt sponsorship deals with gambling companies from the summer of 2026 has provoked a number of mixed reactions, I'm sure. But from your point of view, how might we expect betting companies uh, to be impacted by the Premier League's clampdown on kit sponsorship? Yeah, so... Um Peddling back from that slightly, it's, uh, it's really interesting as it's the first time in a UK league where we've seen um, the league actually itself come out and sort of have a voluntary commitment to reduce um, the exposure of gambling ads within the sport. Um, so I think that's a really interesting step. And at least in the UK, um, there were sort of murmurings and we were expecting the review of the Gambling Act, um, which was enacted in 2005. There's a white paper uh, looking at how that was currently working. And we were all expecting on Tenterhooks that to be something in there um, about uh, reducing gambling ads. But it was actually sort of this voluntary commitment by those 20 clubs of the Premier League. Um, in terms of impact for... Uh, 
for the uh, the betting sponsorships. I think we need to look at scale. So last uh, season, 40% of the Premier League's 20 teams were sponsored by uh, betting yeah. operators. Um, and if we look at that in relation to women's sports, if we look at the top league, the WSL, um, only two of 12 of theirs were, we had uh, West Ham and uh, Everton. Um, so this commitment by uh, the clubs is, is an interesting one when we, we, we're looking in the women's sports space as most of the women's teams don't have separate front of shirt sponsorship deals at the moment. So if they have a, a, men's, club, a men's team in the Premier League, um, the women, um, women's league may be impacted by that uh, withdrawal by 2025, 2026. On the other hand, in three years' time, if, if those women's clubs don't have a Premier League team, then the floor would be open for uh, sponsorship um, by gambling operators there. Uh, there's also a few nuances to the commitment which are quite interesting. It, it doesn't include uh, shirt sleeve sponsorship. So what's traditionally been viewed as a secondary asset in terms of sponsorship deals is likely to um, increase in value. Uh, last season, for example, it was... Uh, it was estimated that it was around 300 million for the, the value of the front of shirt sponsorship yep. Yep. Um, compared to the shirt sleeve at 90 million. So I think we can expect... Uh, sleeves to get bigger? Sleeves to get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and the cost for sponsoring that sleep is a little bit more expensive. Um, but also, you know, stadium hoardings, not much a day. I'm completely tickled by that and trying to contend you. Um, but yeah, so I think we can expect uh, there the to be other opportunities there. And uh, there's, there's no sign of slowing down at, at the moment. Uh, there's three years left and yeah. Chelsea's uh, looking to get uh, a bet sponsor. Uh, at <laughs> least in the short term. Yes. <laughs> controversial at the moment. Yeah, so it looks like we'll be running up to the, up to the end of those three years. And then, as uh, Charlotte said, moving to bigger sleeves. It's the, it's the future. Uh, uh, yeah, new. new whole new fashion range coming out soon, I think. Um, there are some new hurdles for gambling operators to navigate in the UK. We were just discussing it earlier. Can you provide us with a, sort of an update on the new tougher gambling ad restrictions? Yeah, so um, in October last year, the UK uh, regulator for advertising introduced new tougher measures. Um, this was ahead of the World Cup at Qatar. Um, mm -hmm. And basically the new tougher rules are that uh, if, if your gambling ad's likely to have strong appeal um, to a person under 18 um, through association uh, with a popular, uh, with youth culture, uh, then that um, advert would be restricted um, unless there was an age restricted audience. So uh, a betting website or uh, another website where you properly verify the age of those um, users. Um, there are a few sort of carve-outs within that which are quite interesting. Um, sponsorship is excluded, um, meaning that, you know, you could have your match day shirts at least till 2025, 20, 2026. 20, um, and there are a number other, uh, of other small exceptions that you can work around, which I, I won't go into the detail in our short time today. Um, but I, I think it's an interesting one as... Uh, it applies not just to UK operators, it's any operator that's targeting uh, UK customers. So it, it's one to watch for as well if you're, you're not a UK licensed operator, but your ads may work their way into our jurisdiction. Um, and similar things are help, happening elsewhere in other jurisdictions. Um, cool. So I'm happy to talk about it in more detail, but I'm, I'm conscious I'm rambling on. <laughs> no, so if anybody wants to talk a bit further about these, um, come and see Ali afterwards. She'll be more than happy to chat to you further. Um, right, I'm going to chuck some questions out to all three of you, so you can butt in whoever wants to come in first. But uh, what do you think is the biggest uh, issue in increasing the popularity of women's sports? Go I for it. In the context of sports betting, if, yep. because there's a lot of other things I can mention. Also, as a fan and someone has a season ticket at a women's uh, football team, yep. Um, I think that the user experience of the sports books at the moment have been designed, whatever, 20 years ago. And there is still not enough innovation to customize that for uh, female Panthers. Because in, in my opinion, at least, and this is something I've learned also working with a lot of women in this industry, they give you slightly different perspective. And we discussed that, Sarah, before that, yeah. you know, at Fit Construct, we have 40% of the female staff, they look at problems differently that enriches everything. 
And when I look at the sports books, the websites, the user uh, interface, it's very much so built for the previous um, male audience, male Panthers. And I would love to see more of an adjustment for that, especially in the context of the women's competition, so women can support women's sports also in the gaming um, and, uh, space. And I think that's one of those spots that I still surprisingly haven't seen. We have football clubs run and owned by women. I mean, we talked yeah. previously about Angel City yep. Football Club. I'm a big also fan of San Diego Surf. I love the branding around that. Yeah. And I'm just surprised that with women competitions and clubs, we still don't have like a woman-led sports book yep. where things are done the way how the female audience wants to have it served to them. Yeah, there's, there's lots of um, opportunity, I think, for making things more um, about entertainment um, and, and also, I think, just on the, on the data side, like if we're talking about women betting as opposed to women's sports, then um, there's lots of research to suggest that women want to be very analytical in the bets yep. that they place, and so therefore data needs to be available to them um, in the same way that it is on the men's game, and it just isn't right now. Like, it's, it's sort of reserved for the people who, who pay for it, and um, that's something that I think there's big opportunity there. Um, it's a bit like going to watch a women's match, you know, it's a completely different environment. And, um... Well, if you can, because often I see the games overlap, men's and women's games, and suddenly you have a competition, like, I would, I would love to go to watch more women's games, yeah. but often the fixtures are even scheduled in a way that it doesn't even allow you to, you know, yeah. to begin with. Yeah, mm. no, it's true. I think we were both at the FA Cup final, weren't we, Sarah? Yeah. And commenting on how lovely it is that all the all the fans are all jumbled up and uh, it's much more about entertainment and, and a different experience and you bring the family and all the rest of it and um, yeah. that can flow through into the experience in, in betting and, and apps are a little bit old-fashioned, right? And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think totally Paris was talking audience. earlier about uh, the Pinnacle user experience, for example, and yeah. um, it's definitely opportunity there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what came across to me was whether we have I think we've previously, in my view, sort of underestimated the female betting fan um, and haven't targeted them with the right marketing campaigns and experiences, which is what you were saying. Maybe it's a form of lazy marketing um, that hasn't really been tapped into. So I think there are many opportunities um, that will be coming forward. Yeah, and back to what Charlotte was saying earlier, I think it's um, also not having the data there. Um, yeah historically to realize that it was a market worth tapping into. Yeah. Um, so I think back to the earlier question of, of challenges as well, I think it's, it's an issue of investment and exposure and which comes first, the, the data or the increased TV rights deals and yeah. probably need to start unbundling those rights so yeah. that there's performance obligations specifically for the women's sport that are separate from and there's always, performing um, your obligations for the men's teams. Yeah. Sorry, interrupt. Uh, okay. there's, a, there's always a, a sort of conflict on the data side in that the operators want access to more data than the players so that they've got an edge, but the players want more data so that they can play more. So it's a little bit of a, um, a cycle and a bit of, bit of chickens and eggs going 100%, on. 100% agree. I mean, whether this is the, the fast live data or whether this is the deep data, this is all about the narrative. I mean. In all fairness, if you put a broadcast on and you don't see the score line or basic yeah. information about the match, you may as well be watching kids in a park. It's the information on the screen, it's information provided to the fans, some of them whose fan engagement would m move towards uh, sports betting. This is how we build this narrative, this is how we build those opportunities. But in order to do so, you need to treat uh, women's sports almost as a single entity, as uh, Ali said, that you should just take it and start promoting that separately, building all the products around that, and also understand the intricacies. Charlotte, you've mentioned, for instance, the depth of the data collected for women's game is different than the men's game, even the passing styles are different, etc. So I think there's, there's a lot of things if you take this topic seriously, and you really should, because that's a 50%, potential 50% of your market that you're currently not tapping in. Yeah, there's so many opportunities. I think um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the time at the moment. Does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers on the stage? I don't know if I can actually see if we do, but if we don't, we're down to our last minutes. I'm gonna be very quick and ask um, 
you three just really what you think, uh, what does the future hold for betting on women's sport? What does it look like? Mm. Massive increases. <laughs> yeah. yeah. More props, more interesting opportunities, different types of products, different user experience, more entertaining, community-based, so you can chat and um, more uh, diverse audiences. Much better content. I find female athletes extremely marketable. I would probably be much more keen to buy a product where the cool video of a female athlete, whether it's some care or someone else advertising, I just find them much more cool to follow and I find them much more natural sellers of, the, of what they do. So I think if we focus on, on the athletes, if we focus on the content that they have uh, and create much more content out of that, um, as you said, there will be a, a massive growth in both popularity but commercial value also in the betting context. Brilliant. Right. I think we're spot on. I can't imagine we actually hit this timing so well. Um, I'd love to thank my three guests, Robert, Charlotte, Ali. Thank you for joining me. I'm Sarah Butler. And uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.